Hi, I'm Ted Nelson with another disclosure of com computers for cynics. Today's undertaking is the real story of the World Wide Web. In the preceding discussion of Project Xanadu, I skipped over the one-way hypertext systems, one-way jumps between paper simulations based on Hess and Brown, 1967. But in the, the 1980s, there were lots of one-way hypertext systems. Off the top of my head, on the West Coast, hypercards, supercards, note cards. On the East Coast, CALS from the DOD, the Department of Defense, FRAS, Intermedia, the Eastgate School of Hypertext, the new literary style, based on one-way jumps with surprises, making literary hay, hay out of the invisibility of the next item till after you select it. Again, that's the Hess design. Oh yeah, and in Scotland, guide. In 1984, the year of the Macintosh, the CIA finally got their hypertext system, 19 years after they started teasing me with possible backing. It was called Note Cards. I have this from Kathy Marshall, who says she worked on the contract at Xerox Park, and she says it's not secret, just not well known. Would my system with the CIA have been better years and years earlier? Of course I think so, but who knows? 1986-7, Neil Larson publishes Houdini, a hypertext system with lots of links to documents out on the net. His hypertext products also include HyperRes, PC Hypertext, and TransText. 1988, as mentioned in the previous talk, the Xanadu group stumbled and uh, alas got out of control with the unseating of Roger Gregory. Now to 1989, Europe, the first public initiative for what will become the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee, a physicist at CERN, the huge European nuclear research lab, circulates a document entitled Information Management, a proposal, saying, quote, there are few products which take Ted Nelson's idea of a wide docuverse literally, unquote. Actually, as already mentioned, there were several such products, though the people who made them didn't want to admit it. <clears throat> But in that proposal, Tim also said, there seems to be a general consensus about the abstract data model which a hypertext system should use. Hey, wrong on that one. He didn't ask the senator, guys. Our abstract model was off the charts different, but what do you care? <laughs> Next year, 1990, Tim and Robert Caillot write an official proposal, World Wide Web proposal for a hypertext with a capital P in the middle, and they get support from CERN. Next year, 1991, the web starts up locally. Tim's text format and server software are working and deployed at CERN. It's a preliminary package of text pages, jump format, page structure, directory structure, but it does not reach any general public. Two years later, 1993, Mosaic. The web browser as we know it makes history. 1993 is when the World Wide Web really happened. The World Wide Web as we know it wasn't created by Tim Berners-Lee, but by two university students who pooified the net. That is, they put the Park User Interface, or PUI, around Tim Berners-Lee's document format, repackaging Tim's page layout in an application frame with Park User Interface, or PUI, around it. This created not just jumpable pages, as in Tim's design, but a new hybrid, a puppet theater and shop window, now called the, Mo the web browser and Mosaic was its name. The Mosaic vision, that is, Andr Andreessen's vision, was to create a user platform essentially competing with Windows and the Macintosh in which not only could text appear, but interactive applications could be presented. New application cattle pens not boxed inside your computer, but managed from servers on the net far away. Andreessen and Vina could easily have chosen to frame, glamorize, and pooify some other format. Certainly if they'd, if they'd built the pooey to bless Neil Larson's 1986 Houdini format, the Houdini browser, it would have been called the Houdini browser, that would have had the impact of the web. Arguably, it was sheer chance that Tim's format best suited their purpose. Without Mosaic, Tim's format probably wouldn't have gotten any further than Larson's. That's why I think the real creators of the World Wide Web were Andreessen and Bambina. Now, who exactly should get credit for Mosaic? Larry Smarr, who was their boss at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, tells me I'm supposed to say the NCSA browser, National Center for Supercomputer Applications browser, and credit Bina and Andreessen equally. However, it's important to point out that Vina was being paid. Andreessen was doing it on sheer guts and sleeplessness, and many say he should get the main credit. Probably Larry Smarr, too, had something to do with the initiative. So why not call it the NCSA Smarr Vina Andreessen browser, or just Pooey on the net? 1994, the impact of Mosaic. One browser to rule them all, one browser to bind them in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Thousands, powered by the, web, the Mosaic, the web's expansion was now followed exactly, was now following exactly the expansion rate I had predicted for Xanadu. Thousands, soon hundreds of thousands of users were using Mosaic. 
and thousands of servers were firing up in companies and apartments, even in secret hiding places. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, Microsoft jumps in with a version of the web browser PUI called Internet Explorer, which gets off the ground fast because Bill licenses Mosaic from Larry Smar, technically Spyglass from NCSA. And also on the West Coast, Mark Andreessen, who has just graduated from college, is taken on as a partner by Jim Clark, just dethroned from presidency of Silicon Graphics. Clark takes young Andreessen on as co-founder of Netscape Communications, Inc. For a kid just out of college to be brought, on, brought in as equals in a new enterprise by a multimillionaire shows that Andreessen was a pretty impressive character. 1995, Netscape goes public and brings in lots of money. However, Microsoft gives away Internet Explorer, and that kills the Netscape business hope. By 1999, Netscape manages to get acquired by AOL just in time, and Andreessen and Clark manage to get away with their money by the skin of their teeth. So these, those were the important events of web history as far as I'm concerned. Younger people would have a different list. As a freeform standard, the web caught on wildly, and the public thinks it's technology rather than an accidental packaging of a lot of stuff by a bunch of ambitious guys. So whose idea was it? Who, quote, invented the web, unquote? I'm not in this race. I'm neutral on this issue. My team was doing something entirely different, but I want to see people like Neil Larson get the credit they deserve. The notion that Tim Berners-Lee, quote, invented the web shows the process of myth-making. It's like the invention of the telephone. To say it was Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone way dumped down the truth. Many inventors of the telephone don't make it into the standard history. Tim Berners-Lee won the credit lottery for things a lot of guys were already doing, creating viewers and document form formats for jump access among paper-like documents on the net. But Tim's document format was blessed, nay, consecrated and sanctified by Eric Vina and Mark Andreessen when they pooified it by putting Tim's text format into a frame on the internet, the pooey frame now called the web browser. Bina and Andreessen could as well have blessed some other internet text program at that time, like Houdini or Silversmith, or whatever, even Microsoft Word as a world hypertext format, by putting it in a network PUI and making it the Houdini browser or the Silversmith browser or whatever. Did Tim have some transcendent, supernatural understanding nobody else did? He would never make that claim. To repeat what he said in 1989, he built on what he considered, quote, a general consensus about the abstract data model which a hypertext system should use, unquote. He put together a clean and professional package around what he saw as a consensual objective, nothing supernatural about that. But he has undergone a deification process that makes people want to believe in his transcendent supernatural understanding. I'm sure credit has never claimed credit unduly. He is an extremely decent fellow. This is just how the myth-making process works. Where did the parts of Tim's format come from? Embedded format, formatting was from Xerox Park, among other places, as it moved into Microsoft Word. Jump addresses in angle brackets were from Neil Larson's uh, MaxThink in 1984. SGML, which Tim renamed HTML, was from Yuri Rubinsky and it had first been used in a browser by Bottoms in 1987. What I think what Tim should get the most credit for is the URL, where he, whereby he harmonized and standardized network addressing a rational organization across the diverse, diverge, diverse and divergent file structures of Unix, Windows, and the Macintosh, and indeed the whole world. A hell of an achievement. When people ask me what I think of Tim Berners-Lee, what can I say? First of all, I like him very much. I would compare Tim Berners-Lee to Ronald Reagan. Perfect figurehead. A very nice guy. Very idealistic. Upright. Totally focused. Totally enclosed. I've argued with him for hours at his home in Massachusetts and bars in Tokyo. One bar, anyway. With no sense of uh, communication, but as with Reagan, that could just be a pose, a political stance. He needs to throttle initiatives as much as possible. He is trying to defend the formats of the browser. Tim has a very tough political job. Head of a juggernaut, the World Wide Web Consortium, a political tiger by the tail, with running a system that's getting worse and worse, messier and messier, with lots of politics. People wanted to add more and more junk to the web, i.e. to the web browser. And he wants to prevent that junk as much as possible, or at least organize it in the most rational way he can. Despite Tim's best efforts, the web internals get worse and worse, full of special effects and special cases. The web browser format is still misleadingly called HTML. So when, pe when people say HTML, they may think they're referring in some sense to Tim's original clean design, 
but more and more has been crammed into the ever gnarlier and large definition of HTML, a tangled, mangled, reprehensible mess. HTML is now piled high with hierarchies, the document object model, cascading style sheets from Hawk and Lee, <coughs> YARG XML, for which we can thank Tim Bray, tabs, and probably more hierarchies I don't know about. Why? Are documents hierarchical? Sometimes. But let me paraphrase Einstein, who may, may or may not have said, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. I propose this paraphrase. Every document should be as hierarchical as necessary, but no more so. We must not impose false templates in the pretense of orderliness. Great writing and reporting, as in the New Yorker and other key magazines, is not hierarchical, as it strives to represent all the connections of the story. For web formats to impose false hierarchical templates is highly questionable, if not a cultural atrocity. I have to say something about JavaScript, okay. JavaScript is the atrocious language of the web browser. It got its name for strange political reasons. It has nothing to do with Java. I'll just say one thing about JavaScript. I was afraid that telling this would be violating my non-disclosure agreement with Google, but I cleared this with Peter Norvig. In men's rooms at the Googleplex, Google headquarters, they post the day's special JavaScript advice over each urinal, thus reaching the programmer through sensory motor channels that conventional documentation cannot pursue. Don't expect HTML to get any better. Just an ever-growing salad of special case effects. <clears throat> they will add garbage to HTML forever, especially when Tim retires, and don't expect it ever to be as smooth as Flash because the JavaScript will always have to pause and garbage collect. Some negative thoughts about the web from the user's point of view. To begin with, the web is about appearance rather than structure. Any structure you wish to represent must be matched into the one-way jump jumps established in 1967. The very concept of a website is grotesque and should have nothing to do with documents. What I think of as today's typical web page is a flapping, screaming, unprincipled mess with text lines a mile wide that you can't get on the screen all at once because they're locked against rearrangement and they're in pale, tiny sans serif type you can't read anyway. The WYSIWYG model of paper simulation imputes false value to the parts of the rectangle. Desperately valued real estate that must be allocated carefully. Articles are broken into individual par paragraphs embedded one by one in bedsheet sized pages. These isolated individual paragraphs surrounded by flapping, screaming, jumping animations are divided with smaller and smaller thoughts, perhaps for the smaller and smaller minds of the Twitter generation. But hey, maybe it's a generation thing. And of course, we have the social web with its new cattle pens. I won't talk about it. And finally, of course, we have the two new super monopolies, both based on cunning uses of the PUI. The Facebook tsunami versus the Google octopus Hey, the word Google was originally a number, so we can call it the Googlepus. Do you welcome its embrace?